So hi there. Um, my name is Dr. Kasha Brizada. I'm pleased to present to you Dr. Lisa Yanatone, who is a dermatology professor at the Université de Montréal. Um, she's going to speak to us today about identifying the monkey rash and then telling it apart from other common um, rashes. Um, this will be important for the layperson, for the clinician. So without further ado, I'll give it to you, Lisa. All right, so let me just share a few slides that I made. All right, so just monkeypox, uh, tell it apart from other things, which is not as easy as we'd like it to be. So start with monkeypox itself. The classic presentation that you know, we knew of from the endemic areas, uh, incubation period of five to 21 days, usually one to two weeks. Starts from fever, chills, headache, back pain, muscle pain, fatigue, and classically swollen lymph nodes, which is one of the ways that you can tell it apart from other uh, infections. Then the rash starts one to three days after the prodrome. Classically, they say it begins on the face and then it spreads uh, centrifugally to the trunk and the limbs. And the individual lesions progress through several phases, and we'll look at pictures of that. Uh, and the lesions are deep and painful, and they leave scars. Total duration of uh, the symptoms is two to four weeks, so quite long compared to other viruses. And so the individual lesions you'll see on the skin will start off as macules and papules, so basically just like a, a pink, flat pink spot or a, a little pink bump, uh, progress to a vesicle, so filled with uh, clear fluid, and then to a pustule, so filled with white or yellowish fluid, which umbilicates, sort of like the center uh, collapses in, becomes an ulcer, and then a crusted ulcer, classically like a black necrotic crust on them. So this is from uh, the UK. They gave the, um, the different phases. They didn't start with the first one, so like when it first starts, it really can look like nothing at all. It looks like a mosquito bite or a pimple. Uh, and then it'll slowly start to progress through all these phases. So here we see vesicle, the little pustule, the umbilicated pustule, the ulcer, the crusting, and eventually it heals. The lesions are said to be synchronous, which means that they're all in the same phase of evolution at the same time in one area. So not all over your body because the, you know it spreads. They don't all appear at the same time. The ones that appeared at the same time, so one area, uh, will all will be generally in the same phase of evolution. That's not always true, from what uh, my colleagues uh, that have seen cases have said. So, like the um, most of the lesions that I've seen in most cases are in general areas. So that you would see the lesions in those areas would be um, sort of in the same stage at the same time. Exactly. So all then, lesions in that area should be in the same stage. Um, and then a lot of those patients do progress to have lesions elsewhere. So lesions elsewhere won't necessarily be in the same stage as the ones on the general area, but the ones on the trunk, let's say, will be in the same stage as each other, the ones next to each other. So the, um, the, when uh, are you not infectious? Is it at um, the crusting or when, they, when the scab is partially removed? When the scab comes off and it's healed underneath. Oh, okay. That's, and that takes the full 21, 28 days. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a, a long period of uh, infectiousness and it starts um, at the pro, not, not even, so colleagues in Montreal have said that they've seen pre-symptomatic transmission. So even in the incubation period, right before the prodrome. Um, so because you can see it starts off looking like nothing. That means, you know, when you can, if you can spread it while you're pre-symptomatic and then in the prodrome where, you know, you might not feel great, um, but you don't have any skin rash and then you have a skin rash, but it's just a few little pimples. It gives several days of, you know, a window where you can spread it without knowing that you actually have monkeypox. So people should be, if uh, you've been exposed at all or any sort of at-risk activities, be extra careful. And so for the classic, I took the images from the Nigeria CDC. They have an excellent uh, booklet with uh, their guidelines. Um, so they say that the face is the most affected area, 95%, palms and soles, 75%, which is a little different than what we've seen here. And I'll give the stats from uh, the US and Montreal. Um, but all the regions of the skin can eventually be affected, arms, legs, the torso, genital organs. And so these are the pictures. The ones they show always have a lot of lesions. The pictures, I've, I can't share the pictures of patients, but pictures of patients I've seen generally do not have a lot of lesions, the ones that we're seeing here. Uh, even when they have them sort of everywhere, 
this is not really representative of what we're seeing. Um, but you do see that there's different phases. So, you know, one of these patients has pustules, the other one has the umbilicated pustules, the other one's ulcers. So it can look a little different depending on where the patient is in their evolution. Um, and then more here, classic palms and soles phase, and it can uh, give er keratitis as well and conjunctivitis. What, what's the keratitis, just for lay read, uh, listeners? Oh, yes. So keratitis is uh, eye symptoms, so inflammation of uh, the cornea. So that's conjunctivitis and keratitis as well? Yeah. Okay. I'm pretty sure both. I'm not an ophthalmologist, so don't quote me on that, but it can give severe eye manifestations. Um, these are the pictures from the US CDC. Basically, um, a vesicle on the left on uh, a red macule, an erythematous spot, which is pretty classic uh, from the lesions I've seen of patients. They all have this sort of, it sort of looks like chickenpox. So chickenpox, the classic way we describe it is um, a dew drop on a rose petal. Um, so the rose petal will be that red area around. Monkeypox looks like that also on white skin. Uh, I think on black, I'm not sure on black skin, but usually on black skin, red is seen uh, less well. It can still look a little red, but often uh, erythema or uh, inflammation will be more brown in color. So if you look carefully, it's the same on the right, just a different skin colors show up in different ways. These are from the UK. So they have pictures that are blurry, unfortunately, but of the um, ulcerated and crusting phases. And so, yeah, so I say in our current outbreak, the, re the cases are atypical. I put atypical in quotation marks because I don't think we're really familiar with what's typical. Um, this is new to us, but if you look at the literature of endemic regions, there are a lot of uh, more mild cases. They have this as well. They have even, um, you know, an old book from the 70s, we're seeing that even smallpox, there was totally asymptomatic cases of it, um, and mon of monkeypox, sorry. Uh, so it's atypical to us because we aren't seeing like the full blown picture, like the pictures that we're used to seeing, but this is probably not that atypical of monkeypox, I think. Um, so we're seeing a lot of lesions on general organs, perianal region, oral mucosa, sometimes very few lesions, sometimes just one. Uh, and a lot of them don't have systemic symptoms. So then the grain of salt is that there's a lot of lesions are classic. So this is sort of how they were found initially. Um, but now that we're looking for them more, both the CDC and the INSPQ in Quebec have said that, oh, actually, um, we're having more classic cases now that we're looking for them. So the CDC's report said that of uh, eight patients that initially presented with general ulcers, with time went on to have um, more disseminated lesions because this is something that evolves over two weeks these skin lesions so something that presents with general ulcers doesn't mean that they'll only have localized disease um, and the NCP in Quebec said the same thing you know the first cases that were reported to them were uh, picked up in STI clinics so they're uh, you know genital and uh, oral lesions but now there have been several cases declared with more classic presentations lesions on the face that progress towards the trunk and uh, arms and legs. Or it can start off um, looking like basically nothing, like one lesion, and then it becomes more generalized after. Yeah, exactly. It evolves over time. So here in Quebec, 50% uh, have had lesions in the general area, 40% perianal, 34% on the torso, 30% on the face. So a, a third have lesions on their face. It's not uh, uncommon. Um, oral lesions, 20%, and the extremities also 20%, with uh, about a quarter of patients having them on the palms. So it seem to be less common. Uh, and then for systemic symptoms, so some patients have no systemic symptoms at all, um, but many do. Uh, lymphadenopathy, which is characteristic of monkeypox, 58%. So it's one of the things we can use to help us diagnose it, but they don't all have it. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, I've been told that some of the patients that do have it, it's quite, quite large uh, lymph nodes that they have uh, that are painful. 50% uh, fatigue, myalgias, arthralgias, fever, 42, 48%, and then uh, headache, back pain, 20, 26%. So the prodrome stem symptoms seems to be about half. So just for the lay readers, myalgias, arthritis, those are like body aches and joint pains. And I think, you know, when, one thing was uh, where well, you mentioned the sites that were atypical, I guess that's sort of the site of inoculation, given that, you know, it's, it's suspected that many of these are, are sexually transmitted. 
Um, that's so uh, well, well, can be proven. That's exactly what it seems like, um, because one of the modes of transmission, the mode that seems to be the most efficient, is direct skin-on-skin -skin contact. Um, so that's where the the virus is inoculated. That's where you first start to have lesions, but. Once you have the virus, you have a viremia, you know, it goes through your bloodstream and you can start have systemic symptoms and have lesions elsewhere over time. And if in your mouth could have airborne potential, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, because many have ulcers in the mouth and even uh, those that don't, the swabs, mesopharyngeal swabs, oral pharyngeal swabs are all positive. So there's definitely potential for spread through inhalation. And there's a, a case documented of a healthcare worker in the UK in 2018 um, that never came into contact with the actual patient. They were just responsible for changing the bed sheets uh, and they went in with gloves and a gown, but no mask uh, and they caught it. So they think it was inhalation of skin debris from changing the bed sheets, which may be, I guess, but it could have also just been aerosol inhalation if that patient had uh, expelled a lot of aerosols into the air. We don't know, but he definitely didn't get it from skin to skin. He inhaled it. Um, and so then the U.S. is seeing sort of the same as us, rash 100%. 100% is most because that's how we diagnose them. Are there like subclinical cases in uh, in endemic regions, there are, so there could be um, fatigue malaise. And so in the States, they seem to have more systemic symptoms. Uh, fatigue malaise, 76%, shivers, uh, 71%. The lymph nodes, about half, inguinal more than cervical, which is probably just a function of where they um, have lesions. And fever, 41%, similar to here. So all in all, I'd say about half, maybe a little more than half that have systemic symptoms. All right. and so. The Differential diagnosis is sort of in two groups, like the classic eruption where you have lesions a little everywhere, and when it presents as just sort of general ulcers. So for classic eruption, the differential diagnosis is chicken pox and disseminated zoster, which are the same virus, varicella zoster virus. So I'm going to put them together. Um, hand, foot, and mouth disease, another classic Coxsackie virus in kids, and smallpox, which luckily isn't here anymore, it's not anymore, but still uh, important to recognize. Uh, and then general ulcers, herpes, syphilis, uh, and then the last three are um, a lot rarer, uh, lymphogranulum venereum, LGB, chancreta, and granuloma inguinale. So basically we'll compare all to monkeypox. So monkeypox, like we said, incubation, 521 days, the prodrome, one to three days before the rash, swollen lymph nodes, the classic progression of the lesions through multiple stages, you know, the face, the limbs, general region, oral mucosa, lesions usually synchronous, so in the same phase. And then of course they spread over one to two weeks. They are painful and they leave scars. So compare that to chicken pox or disseminated zoster. Uh, incubation is similar, 10 to 21 days. There is a prodrome, so they often have um, fever malaise, but one day before the rash, which is you know, similar. Uh, they don't have prominent uh, lymph nodes, but they can. The lesions uh, can also be similar. So uh, their vesicles, uh, like I said, described as dew drops on a rose petal. Um, they can also become pustular. They can also, like, they're not classically umbilicated the way monkeypox will all eventually look umbilicated, but they can also look umbilicated. They also eventually crest over, uh, classically face progressing to uh, the trunk and limbs. They also have lesions on the oral mucosa in a chicken pox, uh, but they're asynchronous. So you can have in any one area, multiple lesions in different phases of uh, evolution. And they appear in crops over three day periods. So uh, you stop having lesions a lot faster uh, with uh, varicella zoster virus than with monkeypox virus. And I think the easiest way for chicken pox to tell them apart is that they're not painful, they're very itchy. And I think in all the ones we show, it's the only one where there's lesions that look the same as monkeypox, but are very itchy. Um, so that's a really important clue. When it's disseminated zoster though, so usually disseminated zoster will be in an, an immunocompromised patient. It's not something that we see often, thankfully. Um, and that'll be a painful ulcers, uh, but they're less deep. They're very thin. They're more erosions, let's say. So they're still sort of different and they don't usually leave scars. So this is images of chicken pox. You see the little vesicles with the, the red macula underneath and face, so arms. Just for uh, lay people, like the vesicles are like that little bubble you see like uh, under the child's lip or on the, on the elbow, yeah. on the uh, shoulder. Like a, like a mini blister. Like a little blister, clear, like a dew drop, like a teardrop you were saying. Yeah. 
And then here you can see that they can be umbilicated. So umbilicated is when the, the little, uh, little blister, mini blister collapses in the middle, um, which is classic monkeypox, but can be seen in uh, chickenpox as well. So not a good way to differentiate them. Um, here you see a really good on the left, uh, little mini blister vesicle. And then on the right, you see that they can also have little lesions uh, in the oral mucosa. So that's not unusual and therefore not really a, a great way to differentiate. Uh, hand, foot, and mouth disease. So incubation much shorter, two to seven days, usually no prodrome. Um, they can have some systemic symptoms with, uh, with the lesions. Usually it's minimal, low-grade fever, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, so like stomach pain, diarrhea. Um, kids sometimes won't eat, they'll lose their appetite, but it's more to do with um, the pain from the ulcers in their mouth. Uh, they don't have prominent lymph nodes. Uh, they have Macules, papules, so basically little red uh, spots, little red pimples, and these are closed little mini blisters. Although there's a subtype that's been in circulation for uh, maybe 15 years now, Coxsackie A6, so it's newish for us, uh, that can be more severe. So it could actually have more blistery lesions, bigger ones uh, that do end up being ulcers and crust. So it can look uh, a little similar to monkeypox. Classic is hands, feet, and butt. Oral mucosa, like I said, a lot of lesions there. Uh, it can be very painful for children. And asynchronous, so lesions can be in any uh, phase of evolution. This is usually much faster though. It lasts a few days. Usually everything starts to heal within three to four days versus uh, the several weeks with monkeypox. Usually not painful, except the mouth, but on the skin, not painful and doesn't leave scars. Uh, so here we see the little mini ulcers at the back of the throat and on this child's cheek. Um, this is uh, hands and feet, classic ones, classic areas. And here you see again, so little mini blisters. It can look similar, but usually it's not as disseminated as monkeypox would be if it's a, if it's a, a like a classic version where it's everywhere. And when the important thing is like the lymphadenopathy is not there and they're itchy, not painful. As well. No, so these aren't itchy or painful. Oh, then neither. Okay. Neither. So the, these kids just generally don't complain about the lesions on their skin and they go away a lot faster. And usually there's an outbreak in the kids' daycare. <laughs> yeah, I had an exact case like this last night. I had to swab them for monkeypox, but they had the exact story basically hands, a few on the feet. Um, and uh, wasn't wasn't itchy or painful, just really annoying for them. Nothing, yeah, yeah. So a lot of these look the same, and like there are little differences. But I think the the safe thing to do as a physician is to swab them all. <laughs> yeah, that's what we did. We uh, de-roofed and took um, a sample from the vesicle, took the um, the you know the PCR as well. So hopefully we'll find it's out the result. To really rub the base of the vesicle, yeah. even if it's a little uncomfortable, you really have to have to do it. All right, and then smallpox which is just uh, important to recognize as a sort of um, a bioterrorism risk. You don't want to miss it. Uh, incubation, similar 10 to 14 days, much sicker in general, high fevers, prostration, which is sort of like people are so cramped up from uh, the pain. They can have a lot of diarrhea, uh, abdominal pain. They don't have large lymph nodes uh, uh, and as opposed to monkeypox. The lesions are the same. So the same sort of evolution of lesions, uh, although a lot more of them to a point that they tend to become confluent. So they all sort of mix together. Um, they can have lesions in the oral mucosa as well. You know, the same distribution of lesions, the same sort of thing where there's synchronous in uh, the, the adjacent areas, same sort of course where they spread over a week or two, painful and scarring. So really very similar uh, viruses, just Usually smallpox are more severe, but not always because you know every virus comes with a spectrum of disease. So they can look very similar. Lymphadenopathy, if it's there, is the thing that's help, that helps you, but only half of uh, monkeypox cases have it. So these are, you see the lesions on the left could be monkeypox lesions easily, but I don't think like the, uh, the poor little girl on the right, uh, you can see how extensive it can be. And that to my knowledge is not really a, a characteristic of monkeypox. Although I'm sure it can happen because there's always a spectrum of disease. You can see the confluent lesions. Yeah, they sort of start to mix it. Like you run out of skin, they're so close to each other that they start to just blend together. All right, and then as general ulcers. So 
there's a few here, so I'll try to not to, not to not bore you to death with them, but basically herpes incubation is a lot shorter, two to seven days. Uh, there can be systemic symptoms the first time you get general herpes, but usually when it's recurrences, there aren't. Um, they can have reactive uh, lymph nodes, so that's not a, a, a good way to differentiate, unfortunately. It looks a little different. There's a lot of small vesicles, small blisters that are grouped together and can coalesce. Uh, and they progress to erosions and shallow ulcers, so not as deep as monkeypox lesions. Uh, they can also have a red base uh, and affects the genital organs, uh, oral mucosa, but usually not both. Uh, and usually not elsewhere as well. It's really just localized. Painful, but normally doesn't leave a scar. So here you see really the, they're very small little ulcers that uh, coalesce. Um, but you see with the picture on the right that, you know, that, that could be early monkeypox. Um, you have to really keep it keep it in mind. These are from the CDC slide deck. Uh, so you really see the tiny little blisters all grouped together. That's classic herpes. Uh, but then again, the photo on the bottom, you know, it's not so classic herpes that could easily be monkeypox. So all of, all of these, uh, a lot of these viruses, unfortunately, present similarly. Uh, syphilis. So syphilis can have a very long incubation time, up to 90 days, but usually it's one to three weeks. Um, they can have systemic symptoms if they have secondary syphilis, whereas the ulcer is primary syphilis. And usually by the time you're at secondary syphilis, the ulcer is gone. So mostly they don't have systemic symptoms. They can have lymph nodes, but they're small and rubbery versus like the large painful ones of monkeypox. Um, and the lesion is classically an ulcer with a smooth, firm, integrated border. Um, so that's kind of specific to uh, syphilis no pain at all. So people have like a, a big ulcer on their genital organs and not complain of any pain. Uh, it doesn't leave a scar usually. So here you can you can see it on the picture that that border is sort of firm uh, and indurated uh, and these lesions are painless. All right, and the next one, so these last three are um, a lot less common. Syphilis and herpes would probably the, be the two main differential diagnoses. Um, so LGV has incubation of five to 21 days. Uh, they can have systemic symptoms in the second phase. So there's a first phase where there's a little ulcer, but it's very small and usually transient. A lot of people miss it. And then the second phase where they have swollen lymph nodes and systemic symptoms, but usually no ulcer by that phase. Um, the ulcer, when it's present, is small, shallow. It heals on its own very quickly, you know, totally painless. Um, it's very different from monkeypox that would present with an ulcer and the lymph nodes and the stomach symptoms at the same time. Uh, stomach symptoms first before the ulcer. This, there's a, a tiny little ulcer first. It heals on its own, and then the lymph nodes come out. So very different presentation uh, in terms of time course. This is like the ulcer can really look like nothing. A lot of people miss it, say they never saw one. Granuloma inguinale, so this one can also have a long incubation time, no prodrome, no systemic symptoms. They can have large adenopathies uh, that drain or purulent. Uh, the ulcers can be extensive. They have rolled edges, which means that they're sort of undermined. Um, Granulation-like tissue, which means that it's sort of uh, like healing tissue that's very vascular and bleeds easily and painless. So an ulcer, a general ulcer that bleeds easily but is painless. It's pretty also unique. Um, so I couldn't find a good uh, image of granulation tissue. The, the leftmost one is probably the, the one that looks most like uh, granulation oh. tissue. So very red uh, tissue that bleeds easily. And rolled uh, borders is basically undermined. So you have like, you look at the picture on the right, if you take like a little Q-tip, you can, you can imagine that you can get like a little bit under the borders rolled over. And then shine cord, which we haven't had uh, in Canada in many, many years, short incubation, three to 10 days, no systemic symptoms. Uh, they can also can have adenopathy, they have multiple necrotizing ulcers, soft undermined edges, purulent, and these ones are painful. Hard to find pictures of it. Um, these ones I found. So basically the like, extensive ulceration, that purulent, purulent means it can be draining pus. So basically it sounds like, um, you know, location of the initial lesions, uh, yeah. the presence of pain, um, the size of the lesions, um, lymph nodes, um, and then the borders of the lesions. Yeah. Um, it seems like it would be hard to tell apart, um, like, uh, maybe an HSV from monkeypox, like the herpes from monkeypox. Especially primo infection. Well, yeah. with systemic symptoms. Yeah. So most things don't have systemic, systemic symptoms. So that's a really good way to differentiate it. But, uh, primo herpes can, um, and can have a lot of lesions can be very painful. Um, so it would be, I think, difficult to differentiate. 
So I think the uh, the lesson would be in uh, in a case where it's not um, distinguishable, just you know swab, uh, do PCR, and, and then you know uh, isolate until you get the result. I think so. Cases. Yeah. Okay. I think they want us to swab any genital ulcer in Quebec uh, anyway. Um, before the uh, this had been widely disseminated, one of my colleagues saw uh, a patient with perianal ulcers, a, a woman. She thought it was uh, herpes. She sent in a swab, didn't think of monkeypox, obviously, because that wasn't really in her differential until now. Um, she got a call back from the lab asking uh, why you know there were ulcers in that region uh, and she had in the monkeypox and to ask her if she could have the patient come back to be swabbed. So okay. basically, at this point, you know, we're we're trying to chase it down uh, and eliminate it. We don't want to we don't want to live with monkeypox. No. Um, <laughs> and any ulcers in that region, I think, uh, merit merit a swab. So any you know, genital or anal rectal lesions, basically, yeah. um, suspect it, swab it, uh, get public health involved, and hopefully we can squash this thing. Yeah, um, I don't know how it is in Ontario, but here it's um a transport level b or something so it's it's not uh it can't just be transported with your regular specimens if you're not in a hospital uh it has to be like sort of triple sealed in a special box um it, not all clinics are able to do it so we actually have a, a phone number we can call to set up an appointment for the patient at a special testing center and send them there to be tested i think for us it's um i don't think we're taking as special precautions in the as far as we know but i think all the labs Specimens are being sent to the national lab in Winnipeg. Okay. So, and then the Our result is supposed to be available in a few days. Yeah, now, because no, we've had quite a few cases, now the LSPQ is doing the, the PCRs. So we don't have to send them all the way. Or I guess it's going to come to us too then at <laughs> this rate. Let's hope. Oh, God. Well, God our happens. cases aren't going up so fast in Montreal, so that's encouraging. It looks like they're leveling off. Oh, good. Thank cool. God. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. I hope so. Uh, yeah, well, we're doing that. We're doing ring vaccination, and uh, it's pretty extensive. Open so because it started to spread in um, the the gay, bisexual, men who have sex with men community, uh, they opened it to basically anybody uh, in that community that wants to be vaccinated, uh, which I think was really smart to try to. Uh, and I think last time I checked was a few days ago. There were over eight hundred people that had uh, presented themselves for vaccination. So, um, um, can I stop screen sharing now? I guess, or do you have more slides? No. Okay. So um, generally, um, I guess uh, like what we were discussing is that when in doubt, test. Yeah. Especially if it's spreading in your community, uh, it all depends on the case definition, which, as we've seen in public health, can sometimes lag what the reality on the ground is. So, if you and your clinic practice see something like you know um, vesicular uh, lesion, and the hint should be, I guess, the role of chickenpox vaccination plays a role here, right? If you're in a population that's highly vaccinated for chickenpox. Um, seeing a new disseminated lesion in an adult or a child should trigger some alarm bells. Like that's not something you should be seeing regularly. Exactly, varicella is very rare uh, here in Canada because we have such high vaccination rates in Quebec, I think over 90% vaccination rate for chickenpox. Um, so I am not even one a year, I see. So it's- As, Especially coupled with that prodrome, like you know, fatigue, malaise, um, lymph node involvement, that should trigger alarm bells as well. Exactly. Um, and children, I think, normally would have a known contact for monkeypox. Um, so there should be a history of exposure, but we, we don't know. We're just lear we're learning a lot about this virus. It doesn't seem to be behaving in the classic ways that we expect it. Um, so if you see something that looks like chickenpox, especially if it's not super itchy uh, and the patient's vaccinated, that's suspect. That's suspect. Great, yeah. thank you so much. It's good to hear that uh, cases are leveling off in, in Quebec and I uh, wish all the best uh, to the teams there. Thank you so much for, uh, for doing this and I hope uh, all the clinicians and uh, patients out there find this useful. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Take care.